Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I want to say welcome. Welcome to our visitors. Welcome to the Glen Ellen Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're always excited to see all of you here visiting with us. Um, our announcements for the week is, uh, don't forget that on Wednesdays we have prayer time with our pastor. It's on YouTube. You can just look us up, G-E-S-D-A Church. And then Saturdays, we want to see more of you out for our Sabbath school. You can bring your kids. We have a wonderful service for them. Diana does an awesome job with the kids. I love being in there from time to time. And um, the adult class as well, that starts at 10 a.m. We'd love to see you. Um, you know, this week, I was thinking there are so many people that are talking about this eclipse that's happening on Monday. And it's just, at my job, it's like such a huge thing. And I, I shared with my husband, I said, you know, but how many are flocking to get to know the God who created that sun and that moon? How about that? <laughs> so this week, today, and tomorrow, and Monday, let's pray that maybe God is revealed through the happening of that eclipse, because it just seems to be the thing to do. We want to welcome Cedric. Cedric Vine is here with his son. Thank you for coming. We're always excited and waiting to hear what you have to share with us. Uh, Cedric uh, teaches at Andrews University in Michigan. So if any of you have not heard him, I'm sure you will um, have a lot to, to uh, think about today once you leave. Let us open with prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for life. Thank you for the air that we breathe. We thank you for the freedom to come and worship you, discuss you, talk about you. Oh, Father, we thank you for just uh, waking us up and getting us started on our way this morning. And for each and every person that has come here, we pray that you send your Holy Spirit, Lord, um, to be here with us. We pray that as this eclipse is happening, that you will be revealed, that someone who doesn't know you will say, who is behind this? Who actually created the, head, the, the sun and the moon? That's our prayer. And we ask that you uh, just be with us today, Father. May we get to know you better. May we draw closer to you. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
our church and for Cedric this morning, Lord, we ask the Holy Spirit to be with him as he delivers a message to each one of us. May we listen, may we discern, may we understand and be drawn closer to you this morning. In Jesus' holy name we pray, the Savior. Good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath. And it's, um, I seem to be making a habit of this coming to your church. Yeah. So it was, it was only, what, five, six weeks ago, I think. Um, so, yeah, I, I have to make sure that I, you won't see me for another couple of years after this. But um, anyway, um, happy Sabbath, and it's a beautiful day beautiful Sabbath, which reflects our good creator, God. Let's um, just bow our heads as we pray. Heavenly Father, we're about to think about the implications of your word and what it means to be a follower of yours, of you. And we pray that you will give us uh, open hearts so that your word will speak to us and will guide us, Lord, and um, be a strength to us in this coming week. We pray this in your name. Amen. Are you getting feedback? Or are you getting... Yes, sir. We're okay? Okay, so this morning my title is called Pleasure, Pleasure, Pleasure. Um, and it's a follow-on from what I shared with you last time I was here. Um, I shared with you about this gentleman who could be anyone, but apparently that's Epicurus, Greek philosopher... 340 to 270, 341 to 270 BC. And um, uh, he has affected our culture in the West. So that's why I'm talking about him. Is that most of us in the US, in Europe, we are without even knowing it, most of us are Epicureans in some sense. Right? And that's why I'm sharing this with you. Well, you know, we can go hard on this guy, or we can remember what he himself was reacting against. So he grew up in a very superstitious world where everything that happens, there's a demon or an angel, a god behind everything that happens. And he said, no, 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 the gods, he came up with his four medicines, and this is what we looked at last time. We looked at the first two of his medicines. This is a summary of his teaching. Nothing to fear in God. Why? Because we live down here on earth, and they live up in heaven, and they don't bother us. And that's come into our culture. When most of us think of God, by default, we think of someone far away. That's an Epicurean mindset. He's far away, distant. That's Epicurus's view of the gods. And he pushed the gods away so that we can get on our, with our lives. And um, the, the gods upstairs, they're perfect, they're happy, we worship them. But they don't interfere with us and we don't interfere with them. So that was what he did with his picture of the gods. And then he went one step further. The second point was, was that... Um, you can live your life as you want, and the reason is, is that when you die, you're dead, and that's it. No afterlife, no resurrection, no immortal soul, no day of judgment, so you can do whatever you like. You can just live your life without living in fear of the gods. 
So those were the two points that we looked at last uh, time I preached. And this is part two of um, this series on Epicurus. Uh, and I would like to go further uh, today by looking at the implications. If you push God out of your life, or you may well believe him, but he doesn't, he's not active in your life, then what happened for Epicurus, he says, well, our next goal in life, if it's not to keep the gods happy, why do you live your life? And this comes to point three. Good pleasure can be attained. You end up with a life goal which is about living for pleasure. Right? Now, you look at our culture that we have here. Liberty, what, what is it? What, uh, and the pursuit of happiness, what is that? You, you, you. Liberty, how does it go? I'm, I'm a Brit, so you've got to be patient with me this morning. Right? I, I know you... you we, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Okay? Now, the Bible actually gives us a different agenda. It's life, liberty, and the pursuit of holiness. That's the biblical agenda. Right? But if you push the gods out of your daily life, then pleasure usually becomes your goal. Right? Now, none of you are Epicureans, I hope. Right? But imagine you were. And your goal was pleasure. Because that's what our culture is telling us. Right? If it feels right, it is right. Do it. Right? That's what our culture is telling us. So, my challenge to you is, listen to Epicurus and be serious about your pursuit of pleasure. Right? Don't go half measures. If you're serious about pleasure, then be really serious about it. And this is how serious he was. Okay. He came up with a schema. Now, I put it into a table there, right? just to make it easy. But he divided all pleasures into four types. Okay. There's two which are kinetic pleasures. That means they involve change. It might be going from pain to pleasure. And then there are static pleasures. These are pleasures which don't involve change, but they occur over a period of time. Two types of pleasures. And then we can cut those two into four. So we have kinetic pleasures of the body, and kinetic pleasures of the soul or the mind, mental pleasure. And then we can do the same for the static. So let me just run through this very, very quickly. And the reason is, is that when, when most people think of Epicurus, they think, oh, he just taught wine, women, and song. But he didn't, right? That's, that's a mischaracterization uh, of Epicurus. So a kinetic body pleasure. You think of hunger. Now, you know, if I preach long enough, you will think of hunger, right? But uh, hunger is pain, and then we change it. How do we change it? We eat, and then you have the satisfaction that comes after. So there is pleasure involved with satisfying the pain of hunger. Same with thirst. So those involve the body, we would agree, they're physical, and they involve change. And then we have his kinetic pleasures of the mind, wealth and power. Now, I'm not sure I agree with this, but this is his system. Uh, you're poor over a period of time. You, you change your life. Maybe you get a different job or do something, and then you end up with wealth. You are powerless, and then you change something, and now you have power. And hopefully it lasts over a period of time. So those are the, the pleasures that involve pain and change. And then we've got these static pleasures over time. Static pleasures of the body, rest. Right, that's what I do Sunday afternoon. I rest. Right, as long as my football team is winning. Right, uh, then I rest. <laughs> Otherwise I just turn it off and have to go and work in the garden or something. Distract my mind. Yeah, because I'm going through kinetic body pain at that point. But uh, good health, right? Over time, if you're experiencing good health, 
you've experienced it Sunday, Monday, to each day of the week. Right? Uh, and then we've got the static pleasures of the mind. Now, Epicurus, what he taught was, was that the ones, and this is where you've got mental peace and tranquility, right? What he calls ataraxia. You actually find it in Paul's letters. He talks about this. Uh, it's about being mindful. Have you heard this? It's about being able, in control of your mind so that you experience no internal tension, right? Over time, right? Now, I look at that and I think, yes, our culture is pressing each of those buttons and saying, make this part of your life goal. The one he suggests you should go for most is the static pleasures of the mind. Now, this gives us uh, a problem. If we're going to live our lives just for pleasure, then according to the scheme, we also need a way, not just of measuring and ranking pleasure, but we need a way of measuring and ranking pain. Because sometimes it may be worth working hard today in order to have pleasure tomorrow. You Would you agree? A bit of pain today, no pain, no gain. So I'll go through the pain today in order to have more pleasure tomorrow, right? So sometimes we need to accept a bit of pain will actually give us maximum pleasure tomorrow. Ah, but then there are different types of pain. You don't want pain, uh, some pain, all the time. So he came up with a way of ranking different types of pain. We've got natural and necessary, hunger. If I didn't get hungry, I'd forget to eat, right? Natural and unnecessary. This was what he calls physical intimacy, and you can, you know what I'm talking about that uh, uh, there, right? Uh, physical intimacy, for him, it wasn't high up his ranking. He said it's more bother than it's, it's worth, right? Uh, and then you've got unnatural and unnecessary pain, sadism, right? Pointless pain, right? So if you're, if you're going to make pleasure your goal, take it seriously. That's what Epicurus is telling us. The gods aren't involved in your life, so live your life for pleasure. That's his philosophy. And a large part of our culture is prompting us to walk down this road. Hmm. What are the spiritual exercises? If you want to become a good Epicurean, how do you practice this? This mental, mental pleasure. Now, if you are, have you heard of the Stoics? Yeah, Paul in Acts 17 preached to the Stoics and the Epicureans. Paul knew everything. What I'm sharing with you this morning is what Paul knew. He preached in Acts 17 in Athens to the Stoics and the Epicureans. The Stoics believed we live according to reason, pure reason. Everything we do has to be rational, hyper-rationalism. Always have a good reason for everything. So in the morning they get up, and when they do their meditation, they're thinking, right, I've got a meeting at 1 o'clock. How am I going to respond? It's a difficult meeting. I'll plan ahead my response so that I respond rationally. Uh, my response is controlled, right? This is stoicism. And because we are majority Epicureans in our culture, if you go to Barnes & Noble to the spirituality section, there's a whole section on stoicism. People are pushing stoicism as a response to Epicureanism. That's what's going on in, our cult in the American culture at the moment. Go on YouTube, you'll find piles of stuff. Yeah, they're not, nobody's pushing Epicureanism because we are, we are Epicureans already. They're pushing Stoicism as an alternative to Christianity. So that is the Stoic in the morning. If you're a Christian and you get up in the morning and you're doing your meditation, what are you thinking about? I hope you're reading his word. That's Christian meditation, okay? If you are an Epicurean, you get up in the morning. This is how you meditate, right? It goes like this. Hmm. Fish and chips. Can you smell it? Ah. Oh, do you know? 
when we lived in England, before we came here, we had a little dog, a little dog, Yorkshire Terrier. Whenever I see a Yorkshire Terrier, I want to liberate him or her and take him back to Yorkshire, where I grew up, yeah? Uh, taken into a foreign, strange land. I feel sorry for Yorkies here. But uh, uh, <coughs> we had a little Yorkshire Terrier, even though we lived in Berkshire. But we had a Yorkshire Terrier, and um, it, you know, sometimes my wife would make us salad in the evening. And there is no higher food form than salad, agreed? And after eating a salad, I would want to celebrate having enjoyed the pleasure of the salad by taking the dog for a walk. And um, we had a park near the house, two minutes. And unfortunately, my path would take me by the fish and chip shop. And having just experienced the uttermost pleasure of a salad, I think, why not continue this great evening by celebrating with some fish and chips? And it depended on how much. If I had enough money, I, I, I had uh, the pleasure, static pleasure of the mind with wealth. I could afford not just the cod, right? And um, this may come strange, uh, uh, shock as you, uh, for some of you, but fish, they're not square, right? They're not square, right? They come like this. You see them in, in you can go on YouTube and have a look if you haven't seen a fish, right? Go on YouTube and have a look and see what a fish like. They're like this, yeah? Like that, they're long. I don't know where we get square fish here, right? But they're long. Cod, hmm, good. Haddock, even better. I'm doing my Epicurean meditation. Uh, oh, you remember, it's flaky but moist, not too dry. It's got the tanginess of the vinegar, mm, the bite of the salt. Oh, that's... This is Epicurean med med meditation. You are meditating on your past pleasurable experiences. Now, if you couldn't afford the haddock, hmm... Yeah, maybe you, you're not, uh, you haven't got the wealth. Okay, cod row. That's the, the poor man's alternative, right? Cod row. I don't know whether we've got it. Have we got that here? I don't know. Um, so you know what cod row is? Uh, I mean, if, the, if you're an environmentalist, you're going to be a bit upset now. But this is the eggs from the cod, right? So you're, you're literally eating sort of thousands of eggs, yes? And, uh, you know, I, 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 I did talk to my dad about this, and he said, no, you shouldn't feel guilty, Cedric. Uh, while we've got cod, eat them. Yeah, eat them while we've got them. Uh, so this is the poor man's alternative. So even if you're poor, you can find poor man's pleasure to meditate upon. Right? It doesn't need to be haddock and chips. Cod row will do. Right? So we start... Start meditating upon this stuff, okay? That's Epicurean meditation. Now, philosophers in the ancient world came along to Epicurus and to his followers, and they say, guys, you're making full pleasure your goal in life? Hmm. How do you experience pleasure? Through your body, okay? Here's another... I'm not sure, maybe we could call him a, a philosopher, Plutarch. So he's writing just after the New Testament was written. He's a Neoplatonist. So he's, he's Platonist. When you read him, it's like reading the Bible, right? His view of God is incredible. Uh, but this is what he says, and he's criticizing those Epicureans who want to make pleasure their goal in life, their one pleasure. This is what he says. By which, my good friends, it is very plain, they, this is the Epicureans, found their pleasure in a poor, rotten, and unsure thing. Where do you find pleasure? In your body. That's how you experience it. Okay? Your life goal is now tied up with how well your body is functioning, if pleasure is your life goal. And one that is equally suited for pain. So this is the problem. Our body gives us pleasure, but it also gives us pain. That's the problem. By the very passages that they receive their pleasures by, or rather indeed that admit pleasure but by a few, by pain, uh, but pain by all its parts. So how many parts of your body experience pleasure? Your mouth, 
your eyes, your ears, touch. But you know, all part of your body can experience pain. And then Plutarch starts to list the type of things you could get. And you have a look at this. Uh, we've got grievous lamentable distempers, gouts, corroding discharges, gangrenes, putrid ulcers. That's what you get in your body. And Epicurus, when he got old, he had gangrene. You imagine this, right? He died in pain, and the body, which was the means for achieving his life goal, was essentially saying, no, 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 no more. Right? Now, uh, I'm not a doctor, a well, a physician, medical doctor, right? So I just wanted to find out what gangrene is all about, right? That's gangrene. Hmm, that's my foot. Ah, oh, my life goal is pleasure. I'm eating my fish and chips while my foot looks like that. Hmm, okay? This is the ancient critique. Hmm. Now, gentlemen, we don't like to go to see the doctors, right? I, I've talked to medical people, and they say that men avoid going to the doctors basically till we die, till we've got a really good reason, right? And I found this one website, right, uh, on gangrene, and I thought, this is written for men, right? So I don't know whether you can read it, but the words at the bottom, I, I couldn't stop laughing when I read this, it says, gangrene is a serious medical condition. And I thought, what type of person needs convincing that that's a serious medical condition? Now, I'm not going to, please don't sue me, but I'm going to give you some medical advice, gentlemen, right? If you're sitting here this morning in church and your foot looks like that, it is probably time to see the doctor, okay? Probably it's time to take a visit to the doctor, right? Regardless of your insurance state, go and see someone, right? This is the avenue for experiencing pleasure. And the ancients just turned around to Epicurus and they say, you're making your life pursuit the goal of pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. And what does your body give you? Pain, pain, pain. So, there is the basic context, and we could apply that same critique today. If you're going to live for pleasure, you're going to trip up with your physicality. I learned this a couple of weeks back. Right? We had mid-semester break, a week or two back, back at, at, at Andrews, and I was working, writing away, one of the busiest weeks I've had. I took my glasses off just to rest my eyes. Uh, you know, it's the pain of reading too much, right? It destroys your eyes. So I took them off and I went into the kitchen. I was making some food. And I, I looked down on the floor and I saw something that looked like a teddy bear. We know a teddy bear, yeah, a little soft toy. And we have these in our house, right? They, we try to keep them in boxes, but they get out of the boxes. And they have children. That's what I've seen. They're constantly replicating themselves, these, these soft toys. Constantly. You can't control them. And I thought, another one's escaped. So <clears throat> I thought, what can I do with this teddy bear? Better check again. Yes, it's a teddy bear, right? So I thought, I'll kick it from the kitchen pretend I'm a rugby player, you know, they kick the ball over through the thing. American football, I'll kick it through the whatever. I'll kick it over into, uh, into the next room. And all I had was this, my foot. Yeah, no shoes on. I gave it as hard a kick as I could. In my mind, I was the greatest sportsman at that moment until my foot stopped dead. It wasn't a teddy bear. Somebody had left 
a little ornament to go on the mantelpiece. And I, when my foot connected with that thing, I knew my day had changed. <laughs> right? At that point, my day changed. Right? <clears throat> Here is the good news. Working at the seminary for eight years, only pure words came out of my mouth. I, I, you know, I thought about this later, and I just thought, thank the Lord that goodness came out of my mouth at that point, right? What it was, it was a little statue of three rabbits, each with two, uh, two ears pointing up, and it seemed as if all six ears connected with my big toe, right? And it bled and bled, and being a man, I just thought, no, just leave it and we'll see what it's like later, right? So later that day when I got in the shower, it was all, it was all scab. I had to sort of uh, let, let the warm water soften the scab and get my sock off. Yeah, you know, just <laughs> come back to that later, right? Uh, pleasure, plain, pain. There's a second difference between them, right? Make pleasure your goal, and just like that, it can turn to pain. The philosophers knew that. Well, we're not just here for Greek philosophy. We're here to hear God's word. And we can give a deeper critique. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. And I, we're going to read from chapter 2. And I'm going to share with you three points. Three-point sermon. And this is what Solomon tells us. He says, first point is that if you make pleasure your life goal, in the end, you will become self-focused. That's what will happen to you. You will become inward looking. That's the first point we will see from this chapter. The second thing he tells us is that when you make pleasure your life goal, in the end, it leaves you feeling empty. It brings you to despair. That's the second thing he tells us. And then, thirdly, he gives us some hope. He says, if you want to really experience pleasure, the way you do it is not by seeking pleasure, but by giving pleasure and giving pleasure to God. Give pleasure to God, and those things which don't give long-term pleasure suddenly start to give you pleasure. This is what we learn from Ecclesiastes. If you've got your Bible, turn with me uh, to Ecclesiastes, and let me read verses 1 to 9. I'm just going to run through it. And listen to all the areas of pleasure he experiences. Uh, this is from one commentary. One commentator simply sets out all the different things. Now, there's nothing wrong in and of these things. These are good things. But if you make pleasure your life goal, then this becomes a problem. Okay? Ecclesiastes chapter 2. This is what we read. Solomon king of Israel. He says, I said to myself, come now, I will make a test of pleasure. Enjoy yourself. And again, this also was vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad. And of pleasure, what use is it? Here we're talking about pleasure. And uh, the pleasure here, you know, this is Hebrew. So uh, each word has a broad spectrum of meaning. It can be joy. It can be pleasure, enjoyment, any of these things all mixed up in, in this word. Uh, and the, the Greek translation is the same. The word for laughter comes from what we would associate with comedy. Okay? Comedy. That type of laughter. So either of those things, I was going to try this out and see how well it would serve as a master. Okay? So what does he do? Verse 3, I search with my mind how to cheer my body with wine, my mind still guiding me with wisdom 
and how to lay ho hold on folly until I might see what was good for mortals to do under heaven during the few days of their life. So I tried the wine, but I did it while keeping my mind there just to see how it, it would benefit me. And then we continue, verse 4. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water and, and the, uh, to water the forest of growing trees. I bought, bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I also had great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. Basically, I became the richest person that ever lived in Jerusalem. Okay? I had everything I wanted. Verse 8, I also gathered together for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and of provinces. So I conquered other lands and I brought their riches to Jerusalem. I made Jerusalem one of the richest cities in the world. I got sing singers, both men and women. So I tried the arts and delights of the flesh and many concubines. Right? So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure. Let's just pause there and unpack what he's saying here. So you can see what he's going through. Um, let me read uh, what Ellen White says about this. All right? She says this. And uh, it, it, this commentator mentions it. Reminiscent of Garden of Eden. Ellen White, she writes this. Solomon sat upon a throne of ivory, the steps of which were solid gold, flanked by six golden lions. His eyes rested upon highly cultivated and beautiful gardens just before him. These gardens were visions of loveliness arranged to resemble as far as possible the Garden of Eden. What was he trying to make in Jerusalem? The Garden of Eden. Now, she carries on to unpack this. Yeah, uh, he's got choice trees and shrubs and flowers of every variety have been brought from foreign lands to beautify them. Birds of every variety of brilliant plumage fitted from tr flitted from tree to tree, making the air vocal with sweet songs. Youthful attendants. I mean, everything. All your senses are there. It's all there, Garden of Eden. Now, you read elsewhere in the Old Testament, and it talks about Solomon bringing in every day hundreds of sheep and goats and tens of bulls and cows to be slaughtered to feed him and his attendants in his Garden of Eden. So really what he's doing, cre he's creating almost like a hell next door so that in his place he can have this perfect environment. Okay? Now, if you read through this passage in the Hebrew, right, this is what you find, right? This is your Hebrew lesson for the morning, right? There's a... Uh, a preposition. Preposition is a word like to or from, on, at, under. And we have a Hebrew preposition, la. It means to. And then we can add a possessive pronoun, my. To me. To me. It ju it's just li. It's up there at the top. To me. Li. Yeah, it's, it's, it's easy to read. And you can translate that as for myself. As you read through this passage, right? Just have a look at verse four. We'll read that as an example. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards. And my English translation then tells me for 
myself. I made, verse 5, myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. Verse 6, I made myself. Right? The Hebrew word is li. I did this li for myself. For myself. And you start to count. Verse 4, we've got 1. Verse 5, 2. Verse 6, 1. Verse 7, 1. Did I say 2? It's 1, 1, 1. Verse 8, 2. And then verse 9, 1. If you num count up the number of times that he says it was all for myself. Do you know how many times we got? 7. This is perfect self-focus. That's what we've got. Everything in his world is Lee for me, for myself. Right? Let's go back to verse 10. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep for them. I can't do that. You can't do that. I can't do that because I don't have enough money. Right? If I had more money, if I had unlimited money, I probably wouldn't be living in the house I'm living in now. I wouldn't have driven in my car with 210,000 miles on it. Right? I'd probably be driving it. I mean, it gives me great pleasure. Don't, you know, don't m misunderstand me. Right? But can you imagine? It's hard for us to imagine. Maybe Elon Musk. That's the closest we could get to. Right? And even he has limitations. But Solomon, he's saying, whatever I looked at and I wanted it, I got it. I made pleasure my life goal, and what I found I did, I turned the world around. Instead of revolving around the sun, it revolved around me. It was for me, for me, for me, for me. That's what happened to Solomon. The world became a machine to give pleasure for me. I went through that, and it was a great machine. Functioned beautifully, all for me. That was his experience. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil. So, that's the first thing we, we find from this passage. It's not just that our bodies give us pain. It's that when we make pleasure our life goal, it turns us inward focused. It makes us inward looking. Others are there for me to fill my life goals. We end up with a narcissistic culture. Okay? Second thing we learn from Solomon's experience is that pleasure, if that's your life goal, you know, and I'm going to have some pleasure in a couple of minutes next door, right? So we're not anti-pleasure, right? Uh, but if that's your life goal, it will leave you feeling empty. This is what Solomon says. Let's go to verse 18, 18, and uh, down to 20. I hated all my toll in which I had toiled under the sun. That seeing that I must leave it to those who come after me. And who knows whether they will be wise or foolish, yet they will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. Why would he get upset about building this beautiful place and somebody else is going to enjoy it? The reason he gets upset because if pleasure is your goal, you become inward looking, and then when others benefit from it, the system has broken down. <laughs> we continue. So, verse 20, I turned and gave my heart up to despair. Whoa. Gave my heart up to despair concerning all the toils of my labor under the sun. Right? This is how it works. 
right? This is the pleasure escalator. Think of an escalator, pleasure, right? So, <clears throat> now, I know you, you wouldn't do this, but you got your first, your Solomon, he starts off with his first glass of wine, right? Gives him a bit of pleasure. Hmm. Next week, to get the same level of pleasure, what does he need? Two glasses of wine. Next month, what does he need? Three. This is the problem with pleasure. We see it with those who are addicted, to, for example, to pornography. You know, one minute they're watching something. Oh, I saw something there. Next minute, to get the same kick, they have to go into more aggressive, deeper, what do we, I don't know even what to call it. But that is a standard thing with pleasure. If that's your goal, in the end, you need more of it and more of it and more of it to get the same kick. Okay? And that ends up destroying you physically in the end. The other problem with pleasure <laughs> is that you think you make this your goal, life pleasure, and you reorient the world around that goal. My, if I can achieve this goal and improve my life, then I will be happy. Then my next goal, then I will ha ha be happy. Then my next goal. Why is it that people who achieve their life goals often end up the saddest people around? Why is that? Right? Think of people like, it was on the BBC website this week, Kurt Cobain. You remember Kurt Cobain? Right? Committed suicide when he was 27, 1994. I grew up, back in, when I was at university, that's what we listened to. Right? Nirvana. Right? Marilyn Monroe. Was she successful? Yeah. yeah. Ernest Hemingway, great American writer. Was he successful? Yeah. yeah. Robin Williams. Was he successful? Yeah. You see, <laughs> pray God doesn't give you the desire of your hearts. Right? You get to the top... You've made that your goal in life. You get to the top of the escalator, and then you realize there's nothing more. You've made your perfect Jerusalem. You've reordered the world around your pleasure, achieving your goals. And in the end, you end up in despair. why the happiest people are not the rich or the poor, it's the middle classes. Yeah, the happiest people are those somewhere in the middle. All, right, all the data shows that. Right? So, um, what you're doing, you're taking good things God has made and you're turning them into little idols. Right? Ezekiel 14 talks about idols of the heart, <laughs> right? You're making up something that God has made beautiful to be a blessing, and you're making that your object of worship. That's what you're doing here, okay? So, let's end on a positive note, because there is hope, and this is the hope, okay? Please God, and he will give you pleasure. That's the lesson Solomon learns. And here we have it in verse 24. Let me read 24 to 26. I'm going to read through, then I'll just pull out some points. There is nothing better for mortals than to eat and drink and find enjoyment in their toil. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. For apart from him... Who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases God, him, God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy. Okay? What is he saying there? He's saying this, 
right? Is that actually the food and all this stuff is good, it does give pleasure, but it gives you pleasure when who's feeding you? It's from the hand of God. Ethiopian food, right? They have this breakfast dish that they make. It's like this thick porridge. And they make it into sort of a donut, right? And in the middle, they put, uh, they pour melted butter with spices and chili in the melted butter. And then what you do, you sit at a table and you feed each other. Right? You don't put the food in your own mouth. Right? You put it in your neighbor's mouth. Right? The things that give pleasure, they give pleasure when they're not the most important thing in your life. But you're receiving the food and who's feeding you? It comes from the hand of God. I mean, it's like a baby, isn't it? <laughs> when, yeah, mm, go and open up. Mm. Yeah, it's like our cat in the morning comes up and he puts all his hair on. Yeah, he's loving me. Why? Oh, Dad, mm, feed me now. Yeah, right. It's from the hand of God. When we receive our food, when we receive our pleasures from the hand of God. And if you're taking it from the hand of God, is this the God who is distant? Is this the Epicurean God? Absolutely no. This is the God who is present and active in your daily life. And if you view the food you are eating and the drink you're drinking and those pleasurable experiences outside as being in the presence of God, suddenly they give a level of pleasure unknown. It's a gift from my heavenly father. Every time I eat, I'm being fed like a baby by one who loves me. And what does that do? We've seen babies, haven't we? Haven't we? Yeah. You feed a little baby? <laughs> yeah. I, generally, babies look okay. <laughs> I, 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 we, we, we had this couple in the church in England, and they had a baby. And the mother took it out. And this is in Yorkshire, up in the north. Right? And somebody, this old lady came and looked at the baby. What an ugly baby. Right? <laughs> that was the assessment of the baby. What an ugly baby. Right? But if you took some food and put it, that baby might not have been so ugly. Right? What an ugly baby. No, they smile. And when the baby is smiling back at the mother, what's happening? Paul says it like this. Grace comes down and joy comes back. Right? In Greek, the word grace and joy have the same stem, charis. Right? They have the same stem. So the grace is coming down, the gift is coming down, and you're responding, this is a God who is present. And suddenly, I'm being fed by the hand of God. The next... Last part I would share is this. For to the one who pleases him, pleases God, God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy. That's really the lesson Solomon learned, right? Is if I want to experience real pleasure, the way to do it is to give pleasure to others. Is to become, reorient the world not around Lee, 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 around myself, but for me to reorient my life around others and principally around the Lord. How can I give pleasure to God? And what you find is it just comes back in torrents. The God who is present, who is close, 
and who is feeding me by his hand. Wow. God's presence, close presence, brings joy. Psalm 16, verse 11, you show me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. In your right hand, it's close, are pleasures forevermore. Lord, the Lord, your God, is in your midst. He's close. He's present. A warrior who gives victory, he will rejoice over you with gladness. When somebody smiles at you, what's the normal thing to do back? To smile back. You've got a God who takes pleasure in you. <laughs> when he sees you, he smiles. And if you look back at him, the tendency is to smile back. Right? It's how it works. Epicurus, he tried the pleasure thing as a life goal. He ended up dying in pain. Solomon tried it, he ended up in despair. But there is a new Solomon around, the son of David. Solomon was the son of David, King Jesus. And he teaches us the same thing. Jesus didn't need to go through Solomon's experience to learn this. Jesus knew this already. And what he says is this. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all these things will be added unto you. He says, the Son of Man came not to be served, to reorient the world around him, but to do what? To serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so this morning, we live in a culture which is giving us false avenues for pleasure. It's giving us false dreams. It's pushing God out of our experience. Uh, my invitation is seek his presence daily, his close presence, and receive God's goodness from his hand. Make him your goal, service of him, and you'll find you have one of the most pleasurable lives around. To him be the glory and the honor. This is my prayer this morning. Amen. Thank you so much, Cedric, for that message. And we don't want to wait two years to hear that again. We invite you to come back even sooner. Please stand as we sing our closing song, Nothing Ever Could Separate Us.
Father, we thank you that you are our Father and that you care deeply about us. We thank you that you rejoice over us as your children and that we can look up into your eyes and reestablish that link with you, Lord. And we pray that your presence may be manifested through your spirit, through your church, through your word, and through Jesus, your son, in our lives. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Please remember to steer around for potluck. Thank you. <laughs>